Okay, for, for recognition uh, for a data center to have the OSP ready for hyperscale certification, there's a self-certification process. And this process includes an assessment that was created in um, alignment and uh, with the support of the hyperscale community within OCP. And this assessment or checklist includes the must-have requirements for the base building uh, subsystems for hyperscale wholesale deployments. And we've included uh, all the major subsystems uh, within the assessment uh, from the site access for bringing trucks onto a campus, um, allowing for sufficient, ben, uh, sufficient uh, turning radius um, through to the security and access controls for getting onto the, uh, onto the site. We've also uh, added in attributes for the structural aspects of a data center specification, uh, floor loadings, uh, height clearances, and interesting that we had an earlier presentation uh, talking about uh, the use of robotics and automated uh, rack carts. And that's the type of um, sort of uh, attribute that we have included um, and are developing within the assessment. We've also got other areas that um, we ask questions about when the assessment is being carried out around the electrical design, the class rating of the powertrain, the cooling uh, subsystem, again, class ratings and availability for that. Um, sustainability metrics, uh, something else we heard about recently uh, today, um, and aligning with the uh, DCS sustainability metrics uh, work stream and including uh, metrics within the assessment for, uh, for metrics and also certifications. And for a co-location data center to uh, gain this certification, uh, they need to complete the uh, checklist. Uh, that is peer reviewed by the data center facility project community. They then can seek recognition by the OCP Foundation. And once approved, they can then uh, use that uh, branding of being OCP ready V2 for hyperscale and then listed on the OCP marketplace. And some of the benefits for a co-location solution provider is that the uh, assessment validates whether their data center is able to uh, deploy you know, new technology. This could be liquid cooling uh, as an example. It also acts as a market differentiator um, within the industry. And through the involvement with uh, having data center operators within the OCP community, uh, they can certainly be seen as thought leaders. So I'd like to hand it over to uh, Phil and Mitchell um, to uh, talk about um, their experience and their data center in Chicago. Great, thank you so much. So just uh, thank you uh, for this opportunity. And, and just to give you a quick highlight of who we are, so it puts it, it frames the reference. And then I'm going to hand it over to Mitchell, because he did all the heavy lifting. I just talk. He does all the work. So this is uh, the first of our data centers that we've, we've put through this process. We have uh, about 77 across the Americas. We focus on uh, Canada through to Argentina, uh, and predominantly for the hyperscale community. We're a wholesale data center provider. Uh, we've optimized our design to minimize materials. Uh, we were the founding member of the iMasons Climate Accord. Everything we do is about sustainability, speed to market, and uh, ease of use. One of the, the key um, differentiators we have, we have our own cooling technology, uh, which I'll talk a little bit about. Um, looks like a fan wall with actually turbine, so we use a static pressure drop. This gives us incredible um, ability to do up to 50 kilowatts of cabinet in mixed density with very low PUE. Uh, the, um, we use a closed loop water system, so we use no adiabatic water cooling. Uh, so we're able to, to build in places where there's absolute water uh, droughts and, and problems. Um, the, the single units are basically the equivalent of a couple of crays and craws 
put together. So in that four foot space, we can uh, deal with uh, about 450 kilowatts of heat rejection. And uh, we just add more and more and more as we need to go. Uh, we work in a, uh, with a hot hull containment, as you can see. Um, depending on the workloads, we can either have one wall with the, the cooling or have uh, side walls. Again, this is all very much depending on what the client wants. As I say, we work with the hyperscalers. We, they tell us what they want. They tell us how their, their stamp's going to be, and then we work to engineer the space accordingly to give them the optimal power distribution, optimal heat, and uh, the lowest possible sustainability, or the highest possible sustainability numbers. With the advent of liquid cooling, we're part of the, the whole, um, the, the committees here uh, looking at liquid cooling for the racks. We developed our own uh, liquid cooling technology that taps into our loop, and uh, we're working with all of the hyperscalers and the whole community on how that IT loop um, goes into the space, the flow rates, the diameter. I see you in the back there. Um, and uh, working with the whole other uh, cold plate uh, companies to understand how best to optimize this space. But for the next few years, there's going to be a mix of air and liquid. So uh, we're optimized for that. But should it transition to fully liquid, again, that's no problem for us at all. We'll just pull out the, uh, the other uh, cooling technologies and drop them in. But this gives us tremendous flexibility and our clients' flexibility. If they're, if they're not doing a single workload in the space, and they're doing mixed workloads, so they're having mixed technology types. We can do everything from just air cooling to air and liquid at various densities, all the way up to high density, up to 300 kilowatts plus per cabinet uh, with liquid to the chip using uh, single phase. And we're working with the dual phase um, companies. We haven't actually had any requirements for immersion at this point, but should that be the case, we'll just drop those in as well. So the other key element that, and why this is interesting to us and to be part of this community, because this is, we see um, our place as, uh, uh, we, we make the claim that we're the most sustainable data center practice on the planet. So it behooves us to be part of all of these bodies to look at the, the most uh, important aspects of um, how we build, where we build, the materials that we use. But also we, we drove the, the Climate Accord by um, the last four years, we've been tagging every device in our building from the walls to the every part of the MEP with this unique identifier origin mark, which is going to be adopted, I think, tomorrow as an, an identifier for OCP racks. Uh, so we track everything with that, and then we impress upon our supply chain providers to create, if they don't already have EPDs, to create an EPD to give us that, that carbon footprint so we can do a roll up for our clients and say this instance of your deployment in our space, this is your scope three um, number. We Scope two is easy, we've been tracking that for a long time. But I'm gonna stop at this point and hand over to Mitchell because he's done all the heavy lifting and uh, talk about what we did here and then um, what it took to put us uh, OCP ready hyperscale. Thank you, Bill. Good morning, everybody. So for Embodied Carbon, this has been a fantastic project to be part of, working with Origin Mark, putting on everything. It really enhances asset management and puts it onto a global database so that wherever the equipment moves, whoever, uh, whoever inherits it may continue to track the Embodied Carbon. Uh, Multi-purpose with the UUIDs to enhance your CMMS or your um, commissioning and platform delivery pr platforms so that everybody is able to use it. So what it took to be OCP certified for Ordeo 2 The process was relatively simple. Working with Mark and the OCP team, utilize the checklist, talk with internal stakeholders, walk the sites, get the designs, and take all of that culmination in the end and present to the community. And then become accepted and become part of this great team of individuals and peers. Um, Mark listed a bunch of wonderful benefits that come along with being part of this community. But I would like to say the most important, important benefit and the reason I'm passionate about joining the OCP community is all of you in this room, all of you listening in, peers, solution providers, experts in your fields, innovators, you are the reason why we are excited to join. I have plenty of ideas on how to solve problems, but they're just ideas and I'm just one person. It takes a group to actually take that idea and turn it into a solution. You as a group provide the greatest tool and opportunity available. And that is the opportunity to be challenged, to talk to a peer, to have your thoughts, your processes, your ideas challenged and make you think again. 
and work that out so that you can come to a solution in this age of industry revolution with AI to keep our modern world running. That is the greatest benefit and that is the reason why I am excited and we are excited to join the OCP community. Thank you. Thanks Mitchell, thanks Phil. So if you have a data center, co-location data center, and uh, you'd like to get a similar recognition, um, please reach out to, my, to myself or Scott Sharp, uh, my co-lead. Um, complete the assessment, we'll review that. We can then arrange for you to present your facility to the data center facility project during one of the calls. Goes through a uh, DCF uh, peer review, and then uh, you can then um, have your data center branded as OCP. But certainly, it doesn't stop there. We are developing the assessment further. We need to uh, work with the community to make sure that it uh, follows the OCP innovation and which you're seeing uh, a lot of the uh, a new sort of technologies being developed uh, uh, right away and straight and, and now. So we need to develop the uh, assessment further. If anyone would be interested in helping with that, um, then please reach out, as I say, to either myself or Scott. Um, so thank you very much for your time. And um, if anyone has any questions, um, we're happy to, happy to hear them. Thanks. Yeah, okay, is that better? Um, yeah, I'm Charlie Oppenheimer representing ECMA International, a standards development organization. And uh, we're curious to learn uh, where the documentation for the OCP ready criteria are provided and, um, and what, sort of, what sort of auditing um, is associated with becoming certified, whether the, the OCP personnel you know, to what extent the OCP personnel visit the data center and um, go through the list, so to speak. Okay, so uh, there's a link here on the uh, on this slide here, and the slides will be shared um, very soon after the uh, the presentation has been uh, completed. Um, so yeah, you can download. Um, it's all contributed, open sourced, um, and um, as regards the actual auditing, we don't carry out any auditing. This is a self-certification process, so um, that's the, uh, the, 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 the way that the, the, the process works. And it's really for, the, um, for OCP, it's around creating awareness that a data center meets the requirements and then any contractual uh, reserving of space within a data center is carried out between the, uh, the service provider and the user. So we stand back, we have a platform to create the awareness and to give recognition to data centers that meet, uh, meet the requirements. So that, that's how it works, hope that's, that, okay, that so explains. So it sounds like um, there, there are no, no site visits by OCP personnel are, no, that's is are involved. Okay. That's correct, yeah. Okay, thank you. So, Ned, would you say that the process of um, using the certification is a net time uh, addition to a lead time addition for a purchase of a, for a contract, or does it actually enhance the, the speed of delivery of the, the final product? I would say it en enhances it because, uh, so we, we cater mostly to the hyperscale community, and most of those are OCP clients, and their their buyer's checklist is extensive, and a lot of that is just accommodated by by this certification. So it's just one single check instead of dozens and dozens of, of checkpoints. And in to the self-certification element, um, and sometimes those things can be questionable, but in this case, we'd be found out pretty quickly by the, by the buyers and the community. So it, it, would, uh, it would be foolish to try and fudge it, frankly. Yeah, and we've, um, as Phil alluded to, um, the checklist from the hyperscale is, is a much longer list. It <laughs> could be a thousand questions or more. We've um, tried to keep to the, uh, as mentioned earlier, the must-have requirements. So these are about 150 questions. Um, and um, we are s um, 
we're actually uh, not looking for information about the actual uh, data hall specification because that's very proprietary to the, the customer. Uh, so we, we've left that out of the assessment um, process um, because, um, yeah, we're looking for uh, transparency and we th felt that the information outside of the data hall would be um, certainly um, more you know, open to co-location data center operators to be able to share that information. Hey Mark, thanks for leading this effort. I think so. This is a very important effort, especially you know as as the industry um, is moving from air cooling to uh, like liquid cooling. Uh, having this kind of, uh, we have something similar internally, what we call as like screening questions, and uh, I think so. It would be good if uh, those things are aligned so that you know we can incorporate uh, everything that we think as a data center uh, should be ready to accommodate you know all the future hardware be it liquid cooling or air cooling or like higher rack densities. So I'm definitely gonna encourage a couple of folks from my team uh, to talk with you and get more engaged. Okay, thanks Sakit, that's great to hear, thank you.